strategies. And I was a trainer at the academy. And I could see that a lot of the people we were training didn't look like me. Weren't people who represented the communities that I came from. And so I wanted to do something. And with a group of volunteers, we were kind of do our bit to try and write that. As part of that, um, I had been running Dragon's Den, which is, you know, um, an event, an annual event that holds in the autumn where we bring together funders and um, people from BEMA organizations pitch to them for a chance to win something, you know, and in exchange, the funders also give their insights, they network, they get to know each other, but they also help them to understand more about the funding landscape and how they should apply to it. Carol came to one of the events and contacted me after that. She was desperate for help. And um, I, it stuck with me because Sickle Cell, she'd been young, running the Sickle Cell and Young Stroke Survivors, the organization for about 13 years at the time. It stuck with me because I have been closely affected by Sickle Cell. Many of you would have heard of Richard Okoroge, you know, last week who went missing, a young boy again from our community. And Carol was ill at this time. She was exhausted mostly, but she founded the organization because of her son, Daniel, when he was young to support him. And she supported so many other young people like that. But at this time, she was struggling to get any kind of funding in. She asked me to help. I was maxed out on my capacity to do um, pro bono work. And I just could not find a way to help her. She didn't have any budget, but I knew that we needed to help her. I'd been seeing people like Carol come into the training workshops, but I didn't see me enough. They'd come, they'd attend, and nothing would really change with their organizations. And so in 2016, when we started planning the um, Dragon's Den for that year, I invited funders like I normally would. And um, one of the funders said to me that they wouldn't come. So not that they couldn't. And for me, this stuck out. And I asked why. Well, they didn't want to give people the wrong impression. They didn't want, they weren't really used to, these weren't the sorts of organizations that would necessarily put in um, bids and applications that were necessarily, you know, that would demonstrate the kind of impact they were looking for, even though they were very, very much, you know, part of the group of organizations or the types of organizations that they liked. Anyway, we started talking and I asked them if they would fund a project that I had in mind. I, I wanted to test a theory that I had. It was more of a gut feeling you know, at the time I wanted to test it. And thankfully they said yes. And that's how the Avocado Project Avocado was born. Now that particular program has undergone three different phases. There was phase one, the pilot phase, which is the innovation phase as I call it. Phase two, consolidation, where we took a lot of the learning and we implemented it and phase three, the adaptation phase. And this occurred only last year as a result of COVID-19. So I'll talk you through the three phases. In phase one, it was a pilot project. It was funded by the Tudor Trust. We asked them to fund us, give us some funds to test the idea we had over two years with 20 BAME organizations. We limited ourselves to Lambeth, to Sodok and Birmingham. The Institute of Fundraising, Black Fundraisers UK was a partner. And it was supposed to be a blended module of training events and consultancy support. So that happened, that occurred from 2016 to 2018, the pilot phase. And we do have an impact report on our website, which you can check out. After that, some of the things that happened, the impact, because when we did a review, we had an independent review after the two years of this program. And the key highlights, of course, was that we were really pleased that this was a program that was designed and delivered by BAME volunteers and consultants. 
It wasn't like any others. It was strictly those. There was an emphasis on fundraising, but it was more than fundraising. For us, we knew that it needed to be about governance. It needed to be about charity finance, regulation. You see, because we understood that for many organizations, it wasn't enough to help them to understand how to access funding, how to you know, attract funding. We needed to also make them attractive to funders. And so we had a combination of bespoke organizational development and streamlined, streamlined um, training, which we provided over the two years. By the end of that time, I can tell you we're pretty exhausted. So eight BAM consultants took part in this. We spent about 155 consultancy days. Now, these are the ones that we counted, okay? In addition, there was 280 or more pro bono consultancy days. We're literally talking about a whole year, over two years spent supporting organizations. That's how passionate the consultants were. That's how much they went over and above what was required. Now, the result of that was that we also had 100 hours of training that was delivered more than 280 people trained. So it wasn't just the BEMA led leaders who came on the actual program who we supported. There was their staff, their volunteers and other people because for every event, every training program, we left it open so that others who we couldn't provide the in-depth support to could attend and they did in droves. And the only thing that would have limited us was probably capacity. Because the budget was so small, most times our training and the free spaces we could get couldn't contain more than 30 people. So we're looking at people. And then just to mention also that for the actual program itself, even though over the course of the two years, we, we were working intensively with about 20 organizations, we have maintained a waiting list up to today. So we ran courses on bid writing, demonstrating your impact, introduction to fundraising, social media, digital fundraising, fundraising from trust and support, all the things that you would expect. They had formal training. We had organizations from arts and, in the um, arts and culture sector, international development, heritage, medical, education, youth, mental health, they were all represented. It's also important to note that there was quite a lot of crossover and intersectional work going on because many of them would actually potentially be both an international and a youth focused charity or potentially mental health for delivery through arts and culture. So a lot of that was going on. By the end of the period, we found that for what the funder put in, there was a five to one return on investment immediately after the two years. I can tell you that it's been far more since then. So over the course of that time, we were tracking how much the organizations were able to um, raise as their fundraising skills got better, the strategic planning got better, they had greater access to a variety of funding sources. And it was really important to us that we encourage them to diversify their income streams as much as possible. The other thing that was really important to us was partnerships and collaborations with other organizations. And we saw that happening and we saw the impact of that. We asked, well, our independent researcher asked the participants what they thought about the avocado program at the time. And you can see a five minute video that was made from them interviewing them, which is on our YouTube channel. I mean, most of them were quite clear. They had benefited so much from it. Um, sadly, not everybody who started finished but we expected and we anticipated that. And I can tell you a little bit about some of the reasons why. But the thing is their confidence grew, they stretched themselves, they really enjoyed 
not just being on the program, but making the new connections that they did. So from the feedback, we also had to review the program and there were some things that we understood that we needed to do differently. One of them was recruitment. Throughout, like I said, we get kept being contacted by a lot of other organizations. There was a huge need, which I'm sure most of you can identify with. And so we knew that if we were going to do this again, we would not, definitely not limited to just those three areas. We would expand and just let people come on the program. It's interesting that we actually had people coming all the way from Birmingham. I mean, that was one of the things that really humbled me. A lot of our programs were all day programs. And the way it works is we would have a boot camp where we would encourage the, um, the groups to take time out of just working and volunteering in their organizations to actually work on them. And these people will set up either that the night before or very early in the morning on a coach to come and attend this and make sure that they didn't miss anything. I say this, but through the years we've had, you know, and um, some groups, one that came all the way from Leicester, who's actually on the call today on this particular Zoom call. Now, the other thing we le le um, learned, which <laughs> we knew, um, after the first year was that we would condense the program, run it within a year. Two years was way too long. The groups were exhausted. We were exhausted, you know, but we needed to find a way to condense it, take the best bits, run it within a year and allow more time for practical implementation. Because these are groups that are already busy and inundated, struggling with capacity. They couldn't do two years, even though some of them stayed on and kudos to them, but they just couldn't. It was a lot, it was a big ask. So that was the one thing we knew we needed to change. Identity and ownership was also a big thing. You see, even though we were partnering with Black Fundraisers UK, Black Fundraisers UK was a special, is a special interest group of the Institute of Fundraising. And that cost us two groups. When they found out that we were partnering with a white-led organization, suddenly for them, it lost credibility. Even though everyone involved was from a Bema background, it didn't matter. This meant a lot to them because when they applied, they didn't get that impression. Conversely, we also found that the very thing which they desperately protested against, you know, people took positively, the others, they loved the fact that they could work with Black, Asian, multi-ethnic, you know, consultants and individuals who were running this program. For them, there was a lot of inspiration to be gained from that. There was a lot of, you know, participation and just people just being really, really invested because they saw representation. It also allowed us to take advantage of the cultural capital. I talk about all the pro bono hours that the consultants gave. This was only possible because many of them actually identified with the causes they were working with. And so for them, it was natural to want to give more than they were expected to. They suddenly found themselves being invited to events, being asked to do other things. Some even stepped up and joined boards. And so that was really important. I talked about the focus earlier on. We, you know, and the thing about the program is that we've maintained an agility that enables us to adapt as soon as we realize that something's important. So we decided that even though we adapted by year two, we will prioritize financial management, charity accounts, governance and impact measurement because the groups and the funders were also indicating that this was really important. We also realized that we couldn't just drop the organizations. And we're very pleased, even though at the moment we haven't had capacity to organize a formal alumni program. It's something that, that's on our wish list. Many have stayed involved with us. 
we've given them cut lunch invitation to any programs that we run and they know that they're always welcome. They're able to bring whatever challenges they have. And so the community, you know, we foster opportunities also for them to get together. Resources was an important one. I mean, it was okay for two years to part volunteer and part, you know, be paid for some of the stuff that they gave. But at the end of the two years, a few people couldn't carry on a few of the consultants. It was unsustainable for them. And rightly so. Many of the others who've been able to stay on only do it part time. So they have other things going on. And usually they're successful um, consultants in their own right. So that's what phase two looked like. And by the time we got to phase two, we also then brought in race on the agenda. I'd been working with Andy Gregg, the CEO that retired last year for a few years. And it was important, you know, for us to start working with them because we also wanted to expand the groups. And so it became not just BAME, BAMA organizations. And so we started also supporting refugee led organizations. Today, the Avocado Plus program is underpinned by the six characteristics of a resilient charity. This is based on research that's been undertaken by CAF, supports everything that we thought about, you know, in 2016. CAF's research came a few years after, but that's okay. The one thing we do, though, which they don't do and which they haven't identified, which is really important for the kinds of groups that we support is include capacity building. We try not just to provide capac um, capacity through the consultant, but we have other initiatives that are running alongside as well for these organizations. Phase three, last year when COVID-19 hit, we suddenly found ourselves thrust in the middle of receiving requests from all sorts of groups, groups, you know, BEMA-led organizations, multiple, we're receiving several requests daily, weekly. It was growing the numbers that wanted us um, to support them. It was incredible. People were really concerned about the viability of their organizations beyond COVID, how they would survive, how they would thrive. We also had our own um, cohort really concerned and really determined not to have any interruptions to their program. We pivoted very quickly. We took all our learning courses online, which was important, um, taught our groups to begin to interact that way, to learn how to use the different technologies that we were using. And that was great. But the other thing that we did just to cope with the rising demand was also introduced not just the monthly boot camps now, but also weekly brunch briefings. Monday morning at 11 a.m., we invited groups to come and they would learn about something that would help them on the path to sustainability. All of this was driven by the things they told us they wanted. So we had sessions, not just on the things that I talked about before, but we had things on mental health, well-being, resilience, just things that would help them cope with the pandemic and with making sure that their organizations survive. About April, the UBLA report came out. And all that it said really resonated with us because we already knew we were walking down this path with the organizations. But one day something broke me because normally during the brunch briefings we would ask people how they were doing and what was going on with them. And I remember a group sharing and telling us, you know what? We've put out so many applications. Yes, there are a lot of emergency funds, but we're not getting any. And one group told me, this is an arts-based group. The person running it said, She'd applied to so many organizations and she was literally, literally tired. They were trying to put on a show for um, people from the Windrush community who were now more isolated than ever. 
Nobody was really thinking about them during the pandemic. They wanted to put on a virtual show, but they had no money. And then all the applications were coming back as, no, oh, no, 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 no. And they didn't know what to do. And she said one night, just as she was wondering whether she should cancel the show, the key person who was going to be, you know, um, the artist in the play called her and said, hey, are we still going ahead? Please tell me we are because I have no money. All my shows have been canceled. This is the only thing now that I'm relying on. And she didn't have the heart to tell her that she didn't have any money. She was like, yeah, sure, of course. Um, yeah, yeah, it's going ahead. And then she said, not long after that, you know, with the hope that we carry all the time, not long after that, she got an email telling her that a foundation that she'd applied to, which she'd forgotten about, had actually decided to award them a little bit of money. And that was enough to cover the lady's costs. She couldn't believe it. She was so happy. She quickly fired off an email to thank them and to tell them what it meant to the audience. And they came back and they said to her, oh, that's interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And would you like to actually submit your story as a case study? And she thought, why are they acting like they don't know what I'm about? But she went back and reviewed all the applications that had been declined and looked at that one. And that was the only one where she hadn't indicated that the audience she was serving was from the Windrush community. When she told me this story, it broke me. I was so broken. I just went and lay down. And I thought, what more can I do? We were so stretched at this time. With the limited resources we had, we were trying to support as many as we could, trying to help them. You know, for some, we were trying to review the bids that were going out, but it just didn't seem enough. And then it occurred to me that there was something that I had thought about a year before that I wanted to do because just based on feedback that we'd gotten from some of the organizations, they said to us, look, we know that we can only be on this program for one year, but during that year and afterwards, can you have a place where we can drop in and still receive support? Practical things, policies, admin, different things that we can do. You know, we can share space. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we could have a virtual platform that could give them all of that and more. I could take the best bits of the Avocado Plus program, automate it so we could help so many more because we were at breaking point. Thankfully, you know, as Providence would have it, a friend of mine, Ian McClintock, who runs the Charity Excellence Framework, called me that afternoon, Carol, are you okay? Have you seen your daily report? I said, yes. And he was as devastated as I was because it was our experience. This was what we were experiencing. And then we thought, what could we do? I shared my idea with him about the hub. And he said, okay. And I said, my birthday is in a couple of weeks in May. He said, when? I said, May the 8th. He said, oh, that's VE Day. I'm a veteran. I'll do something with you. And that's how we came up with the BAME Dance Challenge to raise some money to build, well, to get the hub started. I was under no illusions that it would take a lot of money, time, and resources, but I felt like I needed to do something. So we did the BAME Dance Challenge. We raised just over two and a half thousand pounds, which was fantastic. People really rallied around us. And so we announced that we will build the Bama Hub. Interestingly, COVID Tech Support sent me somebody, a designer, a US designer, who started scoping the project, you know, and he volunteered over the summer to help to do what he could on Bama Hub. September 2020, we launched the hub. It's a free online platform to help those BEMA-led organizations on their journey to resilience, growth, and sustainability. Just like we dreamt, it takes the best bits of the Avocado Plus program, and it helps people to do that. We launched it, and I'll just tell you a little bit about BEMA Hub since September. To date, we've had 373 registrations. Most of them, 358, 95% or 96% of those organizations are based in the UK. Randomly, we have organizations from Brazil, India, Kenya, Liberia, Nigeria, Sri Lanka, and Zimbabwe. 
which we don't understand. Some of them, yes, because we don't work in those countries, but the others, you know, still bits of how they found out about it. They are spread across all of these UK regions, the East Coast of Scotland and the West Coast, Eastern England, London, Northeast England. I mean, majority of them are in London, expectedly. But there's so many, even on the Scottish borders, in South Wales, Southwest, in, you know, England and the Midlands. This is where they are. And they deal with, you know, different things across the sectors. So from animals to health to research and public policy, we have organizations that are dealing with different things. The registered charities, the social enterprises, community groups, all sorts of people. Now there's a verification process, you know, so we don't worry too much about the people who don't qualify because they don't have full membership. But here's the range. So we have people who literally are on zero and people who earn over a million pounds, admittedly just one or two, who are registering, who need support. These are the challenges. It's really important to us to find out what it is they're facing, where it pinches, because that helps us to focus the things that we organize, the interventions that we're able to provide to them. As we expect, fundraising is by far the biggest challenge that they have. Many of them don't have staff or volunteers, physical resources, interesting isn't it that many would actually just have the founder working and working really hard but all of these things are challenges for them the aim of bema hub is to be a one-stop shop for relevant and accessible support for these organizations before we started, they told us, you know what, we know there's probably help somewhere, but we're tired and we don't have the time to go here, there and everywhere. Thankfully, we have partners who are happy for us to put their resources on the site. We also have all sorts of tools for them to access. For instance, last week, we launched a bid scoring tool where you can write a bid and score it based on the questions that funders are asking to see whether or not it's ready to go before you send it out. That negates the need for anybody to actually come alongside you because you can see the things that if it's freestyle, it needs to cover. It's got the Digital Resilient Health Check. The Avocado Plus program, when our fellows come on it, the first thing we do is conduct a diagnostic check for them. And when they leave, they have the same check. So we can see where they are, prepare a bespoke action plan and report for them, and then see how far they've moved along by the time we finish. We run grant giveaways to the hub, and we have you know, funders, some funders who've allowed us to do that. So thank. But again, this meets the need. Training workshops, they have access to that, networking events. With the City University Department of Engineering, Maths and Computer Science, we run the Tech for Good Internship Scheme, where we place an intern who can solve the tech problem problems over a limited period of time. But the key thing that we get and we keep getting is insights analysis that enables us with the limited resources we have to make sure that whatever solution we're providing is actually relevant and it's accessible. That's really important to us. I want to finish with Carol's story. Carol, last year, January, was elected after we got her on the Avocado Plus program. Instead of shutting their doors, young sickle cell and young stroke survivors continued on, had a flourishing. Carol was elected to the board, the global board, last year. Um, as the chair of the Global Board for Sickle Cell Foundations. Unfortunately, she died in April due to COVID-19. That's sad, really sad, and her memorial was only last weekend. But you know what? Her son, Daniel, and a group of volunteers haven't shut the doors. Daniel and those volunteers are on the current year of the Avocado Plus program because they know what it did for their mom 
for the people that were working on it. And they're determined to continue to support people, people like Richard Okoroge, who we know vanished last week. And so this is the sort of thing that it gives us. I mean, I could share with you so much around the kind of impact, you know, and insights that we get. Um, the prevailing wisdom, for instance, is that most people are online. Maybe if it's um, about when they're most online is mostly midweek, midday. With our audience, we actually see high engagement rates in the late afternoon and evening. We know so much about them and that helps us to give them what they actually need. And we're constantly asking them and responding as far as we're able, you know. At this point, I'd like to just pause because my eye is on the time and I'm aware <laughs> that people might have questions, comments, anything, and I'd like to take them. If we have time, I'll share more insights with you. Um, but yeah, I was told that I need to leave a little bit of time for questions. So please feel free to ask. Um, I can't see you all, but if you do have questions, why do you leave far from us? Carol, I'll put in the chat, it's Kiris here. Can Hi. you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I did put in the chat. I think uh, just to advocate the avocado program was was a, a very beneficial program. And, you know, it, certainly a year later, we only started to get the fruits of the learning from the program. And certainly it's now helped us to get a number of contracts that we wouldn't have, you know, our, our board members had to kind of, they needed to kick up the backside and I think that worked. So I would just like to compliment the, the program and, and urge other people to think about it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. That's really kind. And that's a kind of, you know, report we like to hear. I think one of the questions, Carol, that had quite a lot of votes is the one around uh, BME-led groups and organisations have a pattern of being here today and gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What or who or what is responsible for that truth? <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, I mean... I'm going to try and be fair with that question. Oh, and by the way, I can't see the questions. So yes, thank you, Maxine, for just highlighting that. I'll stop sharing. Um, but yeah, if somebody's got the questions, if you could pop in the chat for me, that'd be very helpful. Who's responsible? I think it's multi-layered. I don't think there's just one person who's responsible, if I'm honest. Most BEMA-led organizations, from my experience, don't have the foundations all the access that their counterparts have. So no one's actually taught them things that we take for granted, that it's not just important to know how to look for funding, it's important to look attractive to funders. In the first two years, we were constantly dealing with people who hadn't submitted that, their annual reports for years not knowing that Charity Commission, for instance, has automated this system. So the minute a funder goes there to do any kind of due diligence against you, all they see is a red mark that's going to send them running. They didn't know this. And sometimes they would even submit their reports and it would have been done by somebody dodgy who didn't really understand charity finance and accounting. That would be a bad mark against them. Okay, so I would say lack of knowledge has certainly been a biggie. Lack of access, like how do people know where to go? And if your resources are limited, what kind of access would you have to a funding database when most of them, the really good ones, offer a subscription model? And I have to say, that's one of the things that Bema Hub at the moment is looking at doing, offering our own funding database that helps people, gives them free access to something quality. So again, it's lack of knowledge, lack of access. But on the other hand, because I've done quite a bit of work with funders, I have to be honest that I think a lot of funders don't really understand how important the work of these needs-led, user-led organizations are. Earlier on, we talked about trust. 
let's face it, if you have the opportunity to give funding to an organization that has, you know, raised more than 500,000 pounds, um, is led by somebody who looks like you, um, and, you know, you communicate and they speak your language. And if your funds are limited, why would you give that money to somebody else? First language is probably not English. Never mind that they're very highly educated. They studied somewhere else, but they've hardly raised any money because no one has given them any money because they have no track record in this country that means anything to you. So I think there are also, in addition to the lack of knowledge and, and the lack of um, access, there's also all of these subtle prejudices that invariably people butt up against. I also think if my second language is English, so my first language is in English, and I'm writing an application, how on earth is that going to stand beside somebody who was schooled in this country? It doesn't matter what I write, I'm never going to articulate it in a way that helps you understand. I also use the example of being able to compare like for like. Because we do a lot of work overseas, I can tell you, sometimes when I say to people, only last month we were delivering training in Cameroon, for instance. When I say to people, it would have been, been impossible to deliver this training virtually. We just have to go there. The infrastructure is abysmal. Expecting people to connect the way they do in this country is unreasonable. Quite honestly, and no matter how passionate those young people are, no matter how dedicated they are, they will never ever compare in the knowledge economy or even with the people here. So putting them and scoring them against the same criteria, I think is a little bit unfair. So I think it's not one thing, it's several different things, really. The other thing I'd like to say, and this is something that I've been sitting on and brewing on for quite a while, and I've shared it with a number of colleagues in the sector. I think that funders hold a lot of power. I chair the Equalities, Diversity and Inclusion um, Committee of the Chartered Institute of Fundraising, where I'm a vice chair on the trustee board at the moment. And I think that funders actually can enable the kind of culture change that we need. They can implement and insist on a number of things. For big partners that you work with and you trust, why don't you get them to mentor and increase the capacity of the smaller ones and make that a condition of the grants so that you can help everybody and pull people up? Why don't you get them working together forming real partnerships that don't take advantage of the little people. That's not just giving them a little bit of money, they get the bulk of the money, give them a little bit to carry the work out and then you report on that. Funders can also decide, you know what? If we haven't really been, give it, been given equitable funding for the 200 years that we've been in existence, how about we write it and enshrine it into our strategic plans and goals? and make up for the next 200 years until we actually get it right. There's so much radical things that they can use the power and the privilege that they have to do. They can also decide, like a couple of funders did last year and some are doing now, in fairness, to give money to people who work with these groups and to tell you honestly, you know what? We know the good work they're doing. We can vouch for them but we're also supporting them to make sure that they continue on the path to sustainability. So there are a lot of things that could happen here. That's it, that was a very long answer. <laughs> it's one that definitely is on, is on the sort of heartbeat because how do we en enable people only in some ways to set them up for failure because we can do some of the capacity work, but the the other arm is the funders. And so it's about ensuring that, yes, the funders are taking part in this journey as well. Otherwise, 
regardless of how much work that has been done with organisations to build resilience, um, those bridges don't exist <laughs> and those pathways crumble uh, for lack of just rigour. So yeah, definitely good. I completely agree with you. And whilst we're on the subject of funders, it always amazes me when people say they're giving you unrestricted funding, but they want to know what you want to use it for. For me, I, I, it, and I guess maybe I'm not just educated enough to understand that, but it amazes me. If I have run my organization in a way that's attracted you and you think we're doing great work, why is it important to dictate how I spend the money? How about you come back and see the amazing work I continue to do. And we work together, we continue to share those plans with me. <laughs> so good. Are there any more questions? Because I can't really see them, if anyone's out there. Or comments. Nobody else is going. I'll, I'll have another second bite. Um, the question really is that, you know, these foundations and funders, you know, the diversity of their boards is still questionable. And, and they, the question I'm asking is, when they start looking at increasing their diversity, uh, they have this one criteria, which is finding people with financial expertise and all these kind of high profile kind of um, organizations that they work for. Should they not start looking at grassroots leaders from grassroots FEMA-led organizations as other options, not just that kind of criteria that they have of, you know, because this person's got all these names behind their initials or they choose them for those kind of positions. So just a thought and what's your thoughts on that really? Is there a funder in the room who would like to identify themselves and actually lend their voice to this? That would be really powerful. I can't really see you all. But Kira, yeah, I agree with you. Lived experience is very powerful. And I think some funders are trying to access that. Um, yeah. And it would be really powerful if you say these are the sectors that you work in, that you find people with lived experience in those sectors to actually make up, potentially, if there's no room on your actual board, maybe a board of advisors who actually, <laughs> Um, yeah, make meaningful contribution. Thank you. Okay. Isaac Blake, I see somebody who's unmuted himself. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, I, I work for Gypsy Roma Traveller Charity, and we've been um, campaigning to make sure that the funders, uh, when revenue from the clients apply for funding, that there's a percentage in the terms of in the life cycle of their grant. So the the let's say the museum might say we're going to put ten percent towards black and brown. Uh, if we have that within the terms of reference that they sign in order to get their money, then we will see more black and brown, which includes gypsy Roman traveller work in these galleries and, and art centres. And I think it's having those uh, un uh, uncomfortable conversations, but we need to get it right at the contract level. So if revenue from the clients want the money, they have to give us their, their uh, percentage of how much their budget in the life cycle of their program they're putting towards black and brown work. Then we will see more black and brown women in the galleries on stage, so on and so forth. Because uh, um, since Black Lives Matter movement, a lot of people came out and said goodwill gestures, but we need them to go a little bit, a little bit further. We we already know big lottery and everybody fund these major organisations. Let's let's make sure the major organisations are working, are actually making a difference, and make sure. But uh, um, not to get personal, but to, to make sure we've got some deliverables, so then we can hold them accountable towards the end of their grant to say well you said you're going to put 10 percent aside uh, have have you done that yes or yes or no i guarantee you if 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 you get right at the contract stage and follow the money we will see more black and brown work in these galleries and art centers because we're just we're just not seeing enough thank you isaac i love the fact that you bring up the issue of accountability it's one that i'm also passionate about because i think if you don't measure stuff and evaluate it and 
hold yourself to public account, you're unlikely to actually do what you say or you won't be as committed to it. Let me be clear, I don't expect that we will, they will get this right overnight because it's taken a long time. But it's okay at the beginning of the year to publish what your goals are in this regard. And then at the end of the year, come and tell people how you did. And if you get it wrong, you try and you keep trying until you get it right. So we're nearly at the end now. I understand we have only two minutes. So has anyone got a final comment or question that they'd like to ask? Yes, Carol, it's Jacinth Martin from Croydon Supplementary Education Project. I just want to um, give testimony that I'm on your current um, uh, Money For You program and it's an absolute excellent course. So thank you very much for you and your team and everything that you deliver month after month to us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Jacinth, and thank you, Curate. Wow, fantastic. I feel um, like I need to, my team will not forgive me if I don't do a little plug here. If you're not registered on Bema Hub, you need to be registered and go get the amazing things that we provide. So that's bemahub.com. Um, check out Money For You's website, where moneyforyou.org, and of course, we're on all the social media platforms as well, moneyforyouth.org. And yeah, connect with me as well on LinkedIn and all the social media platforms. Um, if you look for me, I'm gonna be at Amiki Carol. I'll just spell that out for you and hopefully we can connect. And I think on that note, I'd like to thank you so much for being a captive and fantastic audience.